The true setting of the message is hidden. However, the weakness was leaving the selection of the three letters to the operator at random, and uh, human beings simply are not random. Hut 6 soon saw connections between the two sets of supposedly random letters. Once they got the first three letters, which were sent in plain text, they could often guess the second three, which were in code. One operator called Walter became legendary at Bletchley Park. Every day he would set his rotors to the first three letters of his name, and then type in the first three letters of his girlfriend's name, Clara. One wonderful one, the outside indicator was Tom, and we thought, oh, t Tom, Tom, and we thought that, that didn't work. It was Tom Mix, the, 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 the American cowboy actor from the 1920s, I don't know, <laughs> I didn't know in Germany anybody knew who Tom Mix was, <laughs> but apparently he had a following in Germany. H-I-T was almost invariably followed by L-E-R. Even Hitler was helping to break the enigma. They were given the manuals, they were told exactly what to do and, and how to use the machine. But part of the problem was this myth that the enigma machine was completely unbreakable. And this was buried deep in the German psyche. So therefore they, they thought, well, why bother? You know, nobody can break these messages if we use these keys because they're easy. If you saw L-O-N was the first three, it was almost certain that D-O-N was the second. M-A-D was R-I-D. B-E-R was L-I-N. In the heat of battle, you put up dirty words, and I am the world expert on dirty German words. The worst message I ever had come near me was one from the German high command to someone in Abwehr, the German intelligence, reprimanding them for using um, these words uh, because did they not know that young girls were having to, deco to um, decode them. And of course the young girl at Bletchley was devastated because uh, they were having they went on doing it, I might say, never mind, the reprimand. But it was nice to think the Germans had that side of them, that uh, they did think that uh, perhaps they oughtn't to use dirty words in their encodements. Despite its success in breaking the Luftwaffe Red Code, Bletchley Park had got nowhere with the enigma of the German Navy. And it was the Navy that was now the problem. By the spring of 1941, German U-boats were wreaking havoc in the Battle of the Atlantic. Every merchant ship sunk deprived Britain of the supplies it needed to survive. Slow-moving convoys of merchant ships regularly crossed the Atlantic to and from America. The United States had not yet entered the war, but the convoys supplied half of Britain's food and all of its oil. Although protected by escorts, its convoys were still easy targets for the German U-boats. Hitler had ordered Admiral Karl Dönitz to destroy Britain's lifeline. It was Dönitz who realized quite early on that he could defeat the Allies by bringing England to its knees by starving us. If he could uh, break that North Atlantic route, then there could be no fuel, food, fuel, troops, munitions come to this country. And uh, uh, he could win that war by U-boats. And he nearly succeeded. Dönitz tried to build up a kind of elite spirit, and everybody was proud to take part in that. And we were very eager to join that force. And of course we had been brought up, up to adore taking risks in the, the National Socialist period when we were boys. So we were not really aware of 
of the risk. Dönitz built giant fortified U-boat pens on the French coast. From here, his U-boats could strike out into the Atlantic to attack the convoys. Dönitz organized his U-boats into hunting groups, or wolf packs, operating along specific patrol lines. As the slow-moving convoys crossed the Atlantic, wolf packs of 30 or more U-boats would lie in wait. Almost every convoy, there would be losses. They were very crafty, these German U-boat commanders. They would anticipate our route and often submerge in daylight just ahead of the convoy and uh, let the convoy pass over them and torpedo right, left and centre and uh, we wouldn't know where the attack had come from. Dernitz controlled the wolf packs by radio messages encoded in the naval enigma. Breaking it was to be the biggest challenge faced by Bletchley Park. If they failed, the Battle of the Atlantic and the war could be lost. One mind held the key to breaking the enigma, and it belonged to Alan Turing. Alan Turing was unique. I mean, he was a genius. And what you realize when you get to know a genius well is that there's all the difference between a very intelligent person and a genius. And with very intelligent people, you talk to them, they come out with an idea, and you say to yourself, if not to them, you know, I, I could have had that idea. You never had this feeling with Turing at all. He constantly surprised you with the originality of his thinking. It was marvelous. Soon after becoming a research fellow at Cambridge at only 22, Alan Turing invented the first basic concept of a computing machine. Bletchley Park suited both his genius and his eccentricity. He had funny manners. He didn't like wearing a tie. Uh, he always looked untidy. But he quite liked being out in the country where he cycled around. He cycled with a gas mask on uh, during hay fever period. He, he didn't care what he, what he looked like. He just thought that doing a job was what mattered. He was very shy of women, particularly girls. I don't think he'd ever met any girls before. I did once offer him a cup of tea and he shrank back as if he was going to be shot. And he used to, bless his heart, walk down to the canteen in a curious sideways motion, with his head down. But he was such a star, we all thought he was the most wonderful thing. Alan Turing set himself the challenge of cracking the enigma. In an attic room at Bletchley Park, Turing began studying the U-boat messages. All he had to go on were the scrambled letters. In an astonishing feat of deduction, Turing discovered exactly how the Germans were hiding the crucial message setting. Unlike the Luftwaffe, the German Navy was leaving nothing to chance. Instead of letting the operator choose three letters at random for his message setting, he had to get them from a list. Although Turing had no information about the naval procedures, he managed to identify exactly how they selected their daily keys from a set of secret tables. Instead of replacing one letter with another, these so-called bigram tables substituted pairs of letters. These codes were printed on rose paper in a ink that would immediately fade out if it got wet. So our orders were, in case of any difficulty, immediately to throw this material overboard or at least soak it in water so it could not be read. Brilliant as Turing's deduction was, it was useless without the secret bigram tables, and those were on board.